We're now going to turn our attention to the thiols, which are sulfur analogs of alcohols. Notice that in this general drawing of a thiol, the only difference between this and an alcohol is the presence of a sulfur where we saw an oxygen atom previously. So in that sense, thiols are structurally analogous to alcohols. However, they do have a few important differences. With the replacement of the hydroxyl group for this SH group, this is a group we call sulfhydryl, we change the acidity and basicity properties of the group. As we'll see shortly, the sulfur tends to be a worse base and the sulfhydryl hydrogen a better acid than the corresponding atoms in the hydroxyl group. The second point about thiols worth noting, and the same is true for thioethers, which we'll see later, is that this functional group, and the sulfur specifically, is susceptible to oxidation. This means that the sulfur atom is prone to form bonds with electrophilic oxygen through the donation of one of its lone pairs. And this can result in the formation of new SS bonds, as we'll see later in the course, as well as new types of functional groups involving SO linkages, such as the sulfoxide, sulfone, and sulfonic acid. The basic structure of a thiol is shown here, and it consists of a sulfhydryl or SH group linked to a carbon which is typically sp3 hybridized or saturated, though not always. We do see analogs of phenols and enols, for example, that contain a sulfhydryl group linked to sp2 hybridized carbons. Just like the hydroxyl oxygen, the sulfhydryl sulfur has the potential to act as a nucleophile by donating a pair of electrons to an electrophile. But importantly, this is a difference from the hydroxyl group, it's also readily oxidized, and so that sulfur readily forms bonds with oxygen. As we saw for alcohols, the carbon linked to the sulfur has the potential to act as an electrophile. Generally, the sulfhydryl group is not a good leaving group on its own, but if we can convert it to a good leaving group, for example, by protonating it, this carbon has the potential to accept electrons from a nucleophile. And the sulfhydryl hydrogen, the hydrogen linked to sulfur, is Bronsted acidic and it's significantly more acidic than the corresponding hydroxyl hydrogen. If you focus your attention here, the typical pKa of a sulfhydryl hydrogen is around 11. Contrast that with 15 for the hydroxyl hydrogen. So sulfhydryl SH hydrogens tend to be much more acidic than the corresponding hydroxyl groups. The reason for this has to do with the size mismatch between sulfur and hydrogen. Sulfur is so large as compared to hydrogen that it has very little problem losing H+. Additionally, the negative charge is a bit more polarizable on the larger sulfur atom than it would be on an alkoxide oxygen. For similar reasons, the sulfhydryl sul sulfur tends to be a weaker Bronsted base than the oxygen in the hydroxyl group. And one of the paradoxical things about thiols and thioethers, which both contain this sulfur with two lone pairs, is that this sulfur is a good nucleophile in spite of being a relatively poor base. So it's a good nucleophile in the sense that it readily forms bonds with, for example, electrophilic carbons or other types of electrophilic heavy atoms, such as oxygen. But it's a poor base because it forms weak bonds with hydrogen. And the point I always like to make here is that although these two ideas seem contradictory, how can something be a poor Bronsted base and yet a good Lewis base, the thing to keep in mind is that carbon, or really any other heavy element such as oxygen, is not hydrogen. And there are some important differences between carbon acting as an electrophile and hydrogen acting as an electrophile. It's the latter that happens in a Bronsted proton transfer process. When carbon or another heavy atom acts as a Lewis acid, that's a bit of a different story. For this reason, it's possible for an atom like sulfur to be a poor base and a good nucleophile at the same time. If we deprotonate the sulfhydryl group, which is relatively easy to do in the presence of a base due to this relatively low pKa, we end up at what's called a thiolate, which is the sulfur analog of an alkoxide. And if the sulfhydryl sulfur is a good nucleophile, then the thiolate sulfur is naturally a great nucleophile. So you see thiolates being used, for example, in SN2 reactions and other contexts where we want to form sulfur-carbon bonds with electron donation from the negatively charged sulfur. We see thiols in a number of different contexts in biochemistry, and I'll just mention two here. The first is in the amino acid cysteine. Of course, this shows up in a wide variety of proteins. Cysteine plays an active role in the active sites of a number of enzymes. In other words, it participates in the mechanism of the reaction catalyzed by enzymes. The other place we see thiols showing up is in the molecule glutathione, 
which is an important cofactor in a number of different contexts in the body. So we definitely will see thiols again when we get to discussions of amino acids and proteins later in the course, and you may encounter glutathione in your own studies in different courses in the future as well.